thank the organizer for the kind invitation. Um, so the, in this talk, it's, it will be a 30,000 feet overview of uh, where we think at Argonne the renewable energy is, is the future of renewable energy. And I will give you an overview of what we are doing at Argonne to address several challenges. So Argonne National Lab is one of the 17 national labs at, uh, at uh, United States. It is actually the first national lab. It started with the Enrico Fermi and the Manhattan Project. And uh, it was actually like an annex to the University of Chicago where the chain reaction was demonstrated before moving to Los Alamos to develop the nuclear bomb. So we have a tradition at Argonne of uh, you know, doing things that nobody did before. So discovery, uh, discover new ways, especially aligning with the mission of the Department of Energy in the United States to really develop energy innovation through science and create novel uh, materials and gain deeper understanding of our planet, uh, the climate and the cosmos. So this is the outline. I will start by uh, sharing with you what we believe are mega trends in the world of energy. Um, I will also emphasize the importance of energy storage as, the, as part of the future of energy. The role that national labs, all of them in the US, or most of them play uh, an active role in uh, inventing the battery of the future. And we have at least one other national lab present here, uh, uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, and I think Mo will be the next uh, one of the keynote speakers. And then hopefully uh, propose ways that Morocco can take advantage of all of these trends. So as the world develops, more and more people will be using more and more energy. And you can see here that the humanity top 10 problems for the next 50 years is, is energy. It's really surprising, it's even before food. Energy is crucial to everything. So, uh, however, you know, you can see that most of the energy we use today is something that we take from the ground or nuclear energy, but that one is really limited due to safety reasons and also environmental reasons. So only 8% around that number is renewable energy. The transition to renewable energy started but we all know that it takes a long time for it to set. Uh, as you can see here, um, these are throughout the last couple of uh, centuries, the transition, energy transition. It takes at least 50 years, starting from coal to, to uh, oil, uh, to uh, natural gas. Uh, there is a little bit uh, of uh, nuclear energy, as I said, but then you can see up in the corner, uh, right corner, some little green, which is the renewable energy. So to be able to have a successful transition, of course, we need many, many years. So I can see uh, the world development and having more and more breakthroughs in the next 20 to 30 years. But there are several challenges to overcome. Uh, for example, integration to the grid, uh, making it reliable, and dealing with the intermittency because the renewable energy, they, they are not continuous source. <laughs> so um, the scientific community, of course, it's our job to make sure that we eliminate these challenges. And I think that's one of the reasons we are here today and make the use of this renewable energy cost effective instead of policy reasons. Now, of course, I am delivering the environment, but if people cannot afford it, it's very hard for them to to buy an electric car, for example. So what is contributing to the renewable energy transition is that the price of wind and solar, as you can see here, in the last decade, or two decades, no, just the last decade, uh, become cheaper and cheaper, even more cheaper than coal, as you can see in the United States. So the solar started in early 2009, being very expensive, and then you can see the price drops. And so uh, that's really good news. Um, however, we still have to deal with intermittency and uh, or dealing with day and nights, clouds. So energy storage become a very important parameter for this transition to renewable energy to happen. And uh, 
to be successful. So in the United States, in addition to, of course, generating electricity is an important thing to do, but uh, mobility in the United States is one of the second largest expense in an American household coming after the house itself. Uh, so 70% uh, of petroleum used for transportation and 85% of it is used for on-road vehicles. Um, so how, the question now is how we use electricity instead. Of course, it's good to avoid pollution uh, and good for the climate. But again, we have to make it affordable. So these are projections for the future. And uh, you can see that since uh, 2016, you see the trend is really like exponential. Uh, China is playing a big role in this, uh, uh, driving this uh, growth. And the important parameter we need to keep in mind is to produce cheaper, long range, fast charging batteries to accelerate this trend. And at the end of the day, reach the parity with gasoline cars. So United States, the cheapest car maybe. $17,000, of course the, the range is, is large, but if you look at the cheapest electric car, the LEAF with 100 miles range, it's around $25,000. So the cost is a very important parameter, although it's a little bit more complicated for cars because I think cars uh, represent more value to people. So when you drive a car, it's not like the grid, it says who you are, what you care about, so the projections are not completely straightforward. Uh, so the cost, the range, but also the charging time. You know, when you go and the, to the uh, st gas station, five minutes you fill in your tank. You don't want to be sitting for two hours to charge the car, so it's very important to uh, uh, decrease the charging time. And as you see here, the Chinese market is driving this expansion. As you can see probably for uh, solar energy too, the Chinese market in 2013 drove that, uh, that uh, increase in uh, trend. US is, is following, and then Europe, and, and the rest of the world. So this is uh, comparing China to United States, and the historic data on, on car buying for the electric vehicles. You can see that there is a gradual change in the US. However, for China, is like a hockey stick and uh, this is mainly due to the Chinese government initiatives, uh, uh, incentives, and also expectations. Similar things happened for solar, for silicon solar cells. So, but this is really mainly due to the cost of batteries going down. If the cost is not going down, this kind of trend is not possible. And so here is the battery cost normalized to $28. It's become cheaper and cheaper to make electric cars. Uh, many reasons is the large scale, for example, manufacturing, Tesla Gigafactory, and the newer, cheaper chemistries. So Argon has looked at all this trend and believe that it will continue uh, the cost to be re reduced but there are still problems to solve to reach parity between EVs and gasoline cars. Creation of electricity and the place where we use, uh, uh, the place where we use it uh, is, is must, um, mainly mobility. So energy storage is really the key technology that is the big driver. And I will be uh, focusing on that. So Argon is a big player in the National Lab Complex on Energy Storage. I have the honor to oversee that program. We have world-class scientists like uh, Khalil Amin, who is really a great colleague. I am a nuclear physicist by training, so I, I, I really don't look much at electrons. Uh, I look at quarks and gluons, so he is educating me uh, of, for the importance of uh, uh, the uh, economy of electrons. So what you can see here is metrics for EV batteries in blue. Um, the red is our state, the state's uh, status. So you can see energy density, of course, is a very important parameter. Uh, cycle, uh, uh, cycle life, how fast we charge. And of course, these, <laughs> we have many parameters. It's 
probably quite impossible to optimize all of them. So when you push one, you have to compromise on the other. You can, still use that. You can see that for recycling, uh, we have a lot to do in that, that space, and Argonne and US, and also I think we have a partner, Oak Ridge, started some effort there. So in a you know, summary, we have big challenges to solve. Eliminate critical material, like for example, cobalt, which is produced in, you know, it's not, uh, it's, uh, I don't know about the political stability, but the way also they use child mining, and this is something not acceptable. Uh, so how we can reduce or completely eliminate the use of cobalt, so this is one challenge that we are focusing on. Uh, the uh, initial cost and also the life cycle uh, should be longer. Uh, the third one is charging faster, but then we have to make sure it's safe when pushing so many electrons to the battery. So in addition to mobility, we also need batteries for the grid. And for that, I think the cost is more straightforward. People need electricity. Uh, depending on the use, they are or they are not willing to pay much. So grid has many metrics. Here I'm showing two. In the x-axis shows uh, uh, an important metric, which is how long we want to store energy. And then you have this, uh, the cost. So first use is frequency regulation. So we are trying to get the frequency drifts from 60 hertz to be eliminated. So in that case, battery is used very little, but then it undergo many cycles. It can be expensive as, as, as it is because it's used all the time and it pays for itself. So lithium ion batteries might make sense in that case. For renewable integration, it involves dealing with clouds uh, day and night and storing energy during the day. So battery has to compete with the electricity cost from the grid and also compete with the cheapest gas turbine. So I'm not sure if lithium ion batteries make sense in that case. Maybe a new technology for flow battery could be useful. And the last use is storage for resiliency, and that become more and more important since we are not taking good care of, of uh, our environment with all the hurricanes, the, uh, the, the fires. Uh, so, but in that case, thank God, I hope the events will happen, still happen rarely. So people are not willing to spend a lot of money to buy a battery and leave it in the, the house. So we need really, in that case, time to come up with new technologies. So there are four big challenges to solve. Batteries design with economic and uh, uh, resiliency, it's important, but also uh, cost. Second one, battery life as long as uh, solar panel. So solar panel lasts 25 years. You do not want to change your battery every five years. The third one, we do not want large installations to go in fire. In 2019, more than 25 fires in Korea we had few in the United States. So we have to build safety in the battery. And the last one is new thinking for long duration storage. Uh, of course, we can't have cobalt, and manufacturing has to be cheap. So here is the map of the United States and uh, national labs, the 17 of them. And they are funded mostly by the Department of Energy. Uh, they play a significant role uh, in uh, the, um, you know, because of course we, we are Department of Energy somehow and our mission is aligned with the mission of Department of Energy. The national lab are very expensive. Uh, they have incredible capabilities, which, which I will share with you uh, soon. Uh, they have very significant contribution to the challenge, uh, to solving the challenges. Uh, we have uh, two national labs, as I said here, represented in this conference. And Argonne is one of the best lab in the world in energy storage, and I'm not exaggerating. Um, so Argonne has more than 50 years history. As you can see here, I'm not going through this, but every 10 years we have done something interesting that has impacted the world of batteries. I'm going to give one example, our big success story and then it's no surprise that Carl is one of the stars in that. So um, it's really nickel manganese cobalt cathode, and many cars uh, across the world use it. 
uh, so you can see Carl there receiving the Global Energy Prize 2019. And we are very proud, not only for this work, but of course he received it for, for his very important contribution in the energy storage space. So uh, lesson learned from this success story is that we need to accelerate the time from when we invent a material to its deployment. And as the minister said, it's very important to create jobs everywhere, including the United States. The economy uh, becomes stronger when we do that. And when it's technology, it's, it's really very hard to compete. So it's important. So how can we do that? This can be done by linking discovery science, for example, what I do, to uh, scaling and manufacturing to industry. And this is what is shown here in this slide. So at Argon, we close the loop from material discovery to scale up. Sometimes you discover material, but scaling up um, can be challenging uh, to making real batteries, uh, life cycle, recycling, and test with standardized conditions. So the people who are, of course, they are across divisions, across disciplines. This group work closely with the group that is thinking around the future of transportation and the future of the grid. And uh, we have a, a long way ahead of us. So we are also fortunate at Argon because we have world-class capabilities, very expensive toys that enhance our energy storage program. For example, the light source, which just was upgraded, $700 million upgrade, to be able to increase the brightness and do coherence scattering to study materials, drugs, etc. I will go quickly over the capabilities. So Argon has material engineering research facility called MRF. And this is to scale up materials from milligram to tenth of kilograms. We have also cell analysis modeling and prototyping facility. And uh, this is really similar to industry. We can fabricate uh, cells, uh, cylindrical cells. Uh, this is important in uh, creating uh, similar conditions to industry. And then we have battery test laboratory. We test after we create them, we test them. Argon is number one benchmark testing facility for Department of Energy. We test packs, cells, and modules. And we uh, also uh, develop software that enable us to uh, test for transportation and grids. If there is any issue in the testing, we also have post-test facility. In that case, everything is controlled inside dry box because of the lithium high reactivity. And if something is at large scale, like uh, X-ray, photoelectron spectroscopy, we uh, hook it at the dry, to the dry box. Many equipment and characterization tool inside the dry box as well. Last but not least, we have very, very expensive facilities. Uh, first one is the Argon Leadership Computer Facility. Uh, this is one of few, actually Oak Ridge has another one. And it soon will become in the first exascale capability in the United States. It is important for all science area, of course. The focus will be mainly artificial intelligence. Uh, but for energy storage, it's used in modeling, for example, design of molecule to protect surface like electrolyte additive. The advanced photon source, APS, is a national user facility. And by the way, we have almost 8,000 users every year coming to those facilities because these belong to, to, to the government, to the United States, to the people, actually. It's funded through taxpayers. Uh, APS provide x-rays, high energy x-rays, to study materials. For batteries, we uh, study surface changes, for example, during operation. So in situ, you can operate it and see how the surface or any material change. And then we have Center for Nanoscale Material and the Electron Microscopy. So with all these capabilities, we can tackle uh, several challenges that inhibit the renewable energy revolution, especially in terms of batteries. So I am not uh, going over everything with what Argon, but I'll give you a flavor of it. So let's start with one of the challenges, which is eliminating dependence on critical materials. So in that case, we have programs to reduce cobalt in batteries and also to uh, recycle 
uh, and we have the new center funded by Department of Energy Resale and Argo, uh, with Oak Ridge is a partner. It's a DOE recycling center. It's at the beginning. So far, I don't think there is a, a good economical reason uh, uh, we didn't reach. Uh, uh, it's not economically benefit, uh, beneficial uh, today. So, so projected growth on EV and lithium ion battery is probably not sustainable because of the price of uh, lithium and also the abundance. And you can see here, it's really compared, so, so the, the cost is $7,000 a ton for lithium compared to sodium, which is actually the ocean, 150 ton. So the, the, the thing here is how about replacing lithium with sodium? It's cheaper, abundant, and we might at the same time fix the cobalt issue since lithium and cobalt is this magic, magic combination. Uh, sodium research is still it's in infancy, but there, it has several advantages, it's promising, and uh, there is so much of this material that we can use. As you can see here, this is the, uh, like the energy density versus the cycle number, and we should be in the right corner somewhere there. Uh, there are many candidates that can work with sodium, uh, and for example, some candidates might only use iron and manganese and no cobalt dependence, and this is really uh, look exciting because we have so many possibilities to study. So cost is the main barrier to expand uh, electrification. And the most straightforward way to impact the cost is, uh, of course, increase uh, energy density. Then you can make the battery smaller and you knock down the cost of active and inactive material like cathode, anode, and electrolyte. So I, Argon is pushing very hard uh, you know, uh, in, in reducing the cost. So all lithium-ion batteries use liquid electrolyte. This is why, you know, when we have burns or fires, it's due to the liquid removing it make battery safer. So we can remove graphite and replace it with lithium metal. Uh, lithium metal has 10 times more energy than carbon, and it allows also compact design. The challenge is that can we use lithium metal as the anode? Well, recharging, recharging lithium form needles like structures called dendrite, they can poke through the separation and short the cell. So in solid state batteries, we take a solid and put it on top of lithium to prevent mechanically dendrite to grow. However, we still have lithium to go through the wall so that the challenge is to find lithium uh, ion conducting hard materials. And so if we find these materials that prevent dendrite from forming, but allow lithium transport to move through, then we are in business. The good news is that there are many materials to explore. I'm not going through them, but for example, soft material, polymers, or hard like ceramics. Uh, solid state electrolytes such as sulfate has conductivity similar to liquid electrolyte, but there are a lot of interfaces issues. And Argon has a collaboration, a very active collaboration with Germany to study solid-solid and solid-liquid interfaces. So to increase further the energy density, we can move beyond lithium ion to sulfur. Sulfur is cheap, as you can see here the price, and has a lot of energy from the peak you show on the right there. Uh, Argon has a, ve uh, so, uh, ha has a very uh, active program. The high uh, uh, energy comes from the two electron reaction, and we hope to be able to have breakthroughs in this area. Uh, however, you know, always issues, sulfate has a lot of issues, conductivity, swelling, Shuttle effect. So we are trying to solve these issues, and uh, Kyle uh, will tell us in his presentation how he and his team solve the conductivity and the shuttle challenge. The holy grail of the battery, everybody believes it's lithium air. It's 10 times more energy density than lithium ion. The battery has porous carbon cathode with a catalyst. So you send oxygen, exchange two electrons, and form lithium peroxide. Argon has also an active program, 
and Carl is working in that space as well, and I'm sure he will cover some of it in his presentation in this conference. This is just showing you, if you are using this reaction, then you use air while driving and you release oxygen while being charged. So very clean, very neat reaction. So there are many challenges, including all the impurities. Again, for all, of course, air has oxygen, but not a lot of it. It has a lot of other things. Those impurities uh, can really impact the functioning of the battery. It has also low round trip efficiency, and we have to deal also with lithium dendrite and interfacial issues. So all the systems show, uh, show a lot of promise. At Argon, we have a techno-economic modeling that we use to estimate the cost of the battery in the future. And sulfur and, and lithium air closed would be uh, much cheaper than today's uh, lithium ion. And, and Morocco actually can take advantage of these trends and accelerate the transition to renewable. So Morocco has huge uh, solar potential and um, it's really heartwarming to see that uh, Morocco has, uh, to me, new solar installation. It is uh, the, the biggest in, in Africa and we are all proud of it. And this is really uh, the great uh, start to get Morocco in, in, in into that space. So compared to the US also, Morocco has small distances. So I'm just comparing the distance, uh, which means you can use small batteries and cheaper, and you do not need huge uh, charging infrastructure. You can strategically push, um, you know, in, in, in strategically put them around, around the country, and uh, really a strategic push can make this a reality. In addition, Morocco has the largest reserve of phosphate in the world. That resource, uh, resource can really make batteries based on phosphate uh, sustainable. And uh, one chemistry is uh, lithium ion phosphate. Uh, it doesn't have high energy, but it's adequate to Morocco uh, driving ranges. Uh, these systems have very long cycle life and are very, very safe. And you can see here, that when you, uh, you, know, you poke it, there is, no, uh, flamme, there is no fire, and the curve is also shown there. Uh, instead of having a self-heating uh, runway, uh, you have really almost nothing happening in, in, in that chemistry. Um, our friends in Hydro-Quebec uh, have shown the potential for this, for grid installation. Karim is here. Uh, they, you know, they have large megawatt house, uh, housing iron phosphate batteries. Uh, and I'm sure that I was told by Karim, he's in, in communication with the Moroccan government and hopefully something great will come out of that. Also buses in China uh, are running on this chemistry and even in South California. Morocco can take advantage of this and build collaboration to leverage the electrification of energy generation for uh, the transportation, and I, I would be very happy to uh, collaborate and, and help push the agenda forward. In summary, I believe we are in the midst of uh, energy revolution with renewable electricity replacing fossil fuel. It will take some time, but it's coming. Uh, the transportation system will take advantage of this revolution. We need cheaper, long-lasting batteries with the key to achieving this future. Argonne, with the other national lab, is leading the way to invent the battery of the future. And we are, I hope, this will be uh, a beginning of developing deep ties with the Moroccan institutions. And I was really impressed visiting Mohammed VI Polytechnic University. We start discussing students uh, coming to, to uh, the US, and Carl already started this program. And we have several, actually two graduate students are graduating soon, and they already have postdoctoral at uh, Pacific Northwestern. Hopefully we can do something to accelerate this transition. Thank you. Thank you.